Hey, this is LGBTQ and A, where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with Jacob Tobiah. Jacob is a leading voice for non-binary, gender queer, and gender non-conforming people, and I'm very excited to talk to them. Stay tuned. Jacob. Hi. Welcome to our show. It's great to be here in this little blue studio with, I love these little beaded curtains. That's the first thing I noticed when I walked in. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, let's put that on my body. It's reflecting really well off of you. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> um, let's jump right into it. Okay. Okay. In the gender non-conforming umbrella, mm -hmm. there are a lot of subtle differences between uh, non-binary, gender queer, agender, gender fluid, gender mm. neutral. Why do you prefer gender queer? Well, it's interesting because I don't actually have like a super strong preference, right? Okay. I, the, like it, the label of genderqueer has really been more for other people than it's been for me. Okay. Right? Like the reason I like genderqueer is because I like the word queer because it feels it's still a little bit like it, it sort of emphasizes kind of like the transgressive part of yeah. it, right? And sort of positions it against power in a way that I think is kind of delicious and, and against like propriety, right? Um, and I think that, you know, like there is a way in which my gender goes against what is quote unquote proper or challenges the idea of what is proper. Right. But like the term non-binary is perhaps more, more like technical in a way, right? Like I think it elucidates more of what the, what we're saying about the overall structure of gender. So I like the term non-binary for that reason. But then I think that gender non-conforming is good because it sort of feels like the most umbrella term and it feels like the one that takes the least amount of like public education yeah. to get people on board, right? So I feel like gender non-conforming is really um, fabulous because it's super accessible, right? I think non-binary is really great because it's like sort of gives the real political analysis and I think genderqueer is fun because it's like edgy. Yeah. Also, like <laughs> the like gender non-conforming umbrella, we can call it. Yeah. Which it probably let's let's say everything fits under that. Yeah. We, we can make the statement today. We yes. we don't say no. It does though. Um. It it's very accepting. Yeah. Like it, even like people who fall within the binary, you know, can like be gender non-conforming, and it's like it's. It's more like welcoming sounding. Well, yeah, and I'm also not like, I'm like kind of, I'm kind of like everyone is gender non-conforming yeah. at some point, right? And like even people who identify in a binary way, I'm kind of like, yeah, but, but like how binary are you though, right? Like everyone has moments of fluidity. Everyone has moments, like everyone's gender presentation changes throughout the day. Yeah. Right? Like even putting on your makeup is an, is is like a gender change, right? Like changing out of pajamas and into whatever you're wearing for the day is a gender change, right? Like gender change is part of everyone's life, even if people identify in a binary fashion. Yeah. So I'm just kind of like, you know, let's open this up a little. Yeah. Also like in terms of like the PR mission that queer people are having, just because we need more mm. acceptance, mm. like gender queer is just like a sexy word. I think you know? it is sexy. <laughs> That's kind of why I like it. It feels sexy. That's okay. Yeah. Do you, do you feel pressure to present in a gender queer way, like on a day-to-day -day basis? No, I used to. I used yeah. to feel like I had to like prove my identity or whatever. Yeah. Um, and now I'm much better at sort of being like, yeah, part of, the, part of this whole thing is that like your gender is allowed to be whatever it needs to be or wants to be that day. Yeah. Right. And there also are, like in or out of clothes to cut you off in or out yeah. of clothes, like naked Jacob is still genderqueer. Well, yeah, but also like, but also it's just kind of like genderqueer doesn't look like one thing. Right. Right. And like non-binary people don't look like one thing. And that's the point. Right. The point is that you should not have to prove your gender to anyone ever in order to have it respected, right? Like I shouldn't have to be wearing a dress in order for me to just be like, this is how I feel and this is how I know myself to be. And also no matter how like butch I'm dressed, I'm still pretty femmy, you know? Like <laughs> so on days when I'm like, wow, I'm having a butch day. Everyone's like, Jacob, you're wearing like, you're wearing like rolled up jean shorts and like a slightly cut off tee. Like, you're it's, like, but my lips is darker. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, but my lip, but I don't have lipstick on. And they're like, you're still pretty femmy. And I'm like, what? <laughs> No, I'm a butch boy today, you know. And every now and then I have butchy days, but even when I put on a suit, I still feel really feminine. I'm, I'm sure you still have your like nails too. In yeah, a suit. yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, for everyone listening, you're wearing black and white polka dots. Yes. Is this a dress? It I is a dress. It's a black and white polka dot dress, and it sort of buttons up though, like a blazer. Like very professional. It's like a grandma look. 
Kind of. It's like what it's like what your grandma would wear. Uh, a lot of your style veers like the 1950s like era. Kind of. It's kind of a satire, right? It's sort of a joke. It's sort of like this is fun. You know, I, I feel like it's funny to sort of riff on classic looks. And it's also because I really love um, like I don't really like new clothes very much. You know, like new clothes are fine, but I always feel like whenever I pull a price tag off of something and like it was made and it's I'm the first one to wear it. I always feel a little weird about that. Like, I love secondhand stuff. I love thrifted. I love vintage because it feels like I'm giving clothes that nobody wanted a home. You know, it's like it feels it feels like there's sort of this weird spiritual connection with like whoever the previous owner was. And I'm like, who were the fabulous ladies who owned these sequin garments or the fabulous queens who owned these sequin garments? Right. Like, where did they come from? Like, who wore this polka dot dress before I did? Yeah. Although this dress is actually on loan. One of my friends is traveling around the world right now and is like, you know, doing a big old like world trip. And so that instead of paying for a storage unit, they just like stored their clothes with like various friends who are allowed to wear them during the period in which you're borrowing them. Do they know you're wearing that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, they know I'm wearing, they know, they know I'm like, they were like, you can wear this stuff. Um, you know, like just make sure you give it back to me, but you can borrow it for, for while I'm running around the world. Wait, is your friend genderqueer? Yeah. This is like the underground, like secrets of genderqueer life. We just share clothes. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the sisterhood of the traveling 1950s grandma dress. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it out. Can we shout out who it is? Yeah, it's my friend Alok, who's a um, who's a Alok Vedmanan. Is that dark matter? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, Alok's a poet poetry. and like a really brilliant and a super oh cutie, and we've been friends for a while. Oh, and they and were like, they're here in spirit now. Yeah, totally. Oh my God. I love that through through this polka dot. <laughs> <laughs> you are like a very confident person. Do you? F I uh, that's not a co an insult. <laughs> no, 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 I know. I'm oh. just I'm just kind of like yes, I am good oh, at faking it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, your face dropped. Um, yeah, no. I, I say that because I feel like you have to be in order to, like to mm. sell mm. that I'm not just a man on the dress. Like this is who I am. Like do you, is that a lot of pressure though? I mean, I think it used to feel like a lot of pressure, and and the 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 times when it's scary, it's not about. Like, I don't get scared before I go to, like, a board meeting or something in a dress or before I go for, like, you know, some, some like, networking thing or some career thing. The times that are still scary for me or the times that are still tough are just, like, sometimes just walking around on the street. Like, I live in New York, right? I mean, L.A. is kind of beautiful in a sense because it's very, you know, auto-centric. So you don't really have to walk around in public all that much like comparatively, whereas, you know, New York, I take the subway everywhere. I rely on public transportation all the time. And so my gender is kind of up for public consumption. Uh, and in a city like New York, you're running into new people almost constantly. So people are having the first reaction they've ever had to someone who looks like me a lot of times live in front of me. And I'm just like, it's a Thursday and I'm on the subway going to work, right. you know? And so sometimes the moments when I'm scared are not really moments around like walking a red carpet is easy walking a red carpet's like whatever like fun you know I mean the only thing I'm scared about there is like is that pimple covered up properly right like you know the but the gendered part of it isn't scary at all it's easy it feels celebratory it feels great it's just the parts where I'm sort of having to deal with people's live reactions from total strangers which you know can turn into harassment or can turn into catcalling or can turn into violence in in worst case scenarios that's when I think when I really think about that, I get a little bit, like a little bit scared. But a choice that I've made, I think, as a as a as a you know gender non-conforming person, is just to sort of be very oblivious of what others think about about how I present myself, and just you know like let myself live in a little bubble in my head. Yeah, and you it's know? almost like how could you not? How could you like confront it all the time every day? Yeah, I would never leave my house. Right, I just wouldn't. I because I just I don't think about my gender as much as I assume mm. like you have to. And I think part of it is uh, I've been working really hard to not have to think about my gender and figuring out what denial mechanisms do I need to set up so that I just don't have to think about it as much. You know, yeah. like there's there's a degree to which you know there are every now and then there are moments where I'm like maybe if I just presented Butch. Um, like what would be easier for me? Like what would work out for me? And I used to kind of go down that train of thought a lot. Yeah. And I learned, you know, over the past few years, I've really learned that A, that's super unproductive. And B, part of, part of the way that you can kind of make this thing happen and make this thing work is if you just blast everybody away with confidence, you're able to pull shit off that you maybe shouldn't or aren't supposed to, right? And if you're just kind of like, I mean, for example, you know, with... Like, like when I went to 30 Rock for the first time to film for my web series with NBC News, I was like, you know, very scared and felt super out of place and was looking around. And I was like, I don't think people like me really walk around here a lot and, and do a lot 
you know, here. Yeah. And I just had to be like, nah, I'm supposed to be here and this is perfect and I'm great and this is everything. Yeah. And it's all fine and I'm not going to think about like the what ifs. I'm not going to think about whether or not I should be here. Like I am here, so I'm supposed to be here. Yeah, and like someone has to. Yeah. It and it's it's fascinating too, like where we are today mm. in terms of our understanding of gender. Like mm. when did who did you have to look up to? Like did you know of any like gender queer people when you were coming out? Um it was I mean, it was interesting because I think uh the people that I probably would have looked up to or should have looked up to really just scared me. Right. Like I remember watching Labyrinth. One of my best friends, Paige, was really obsessed with Labyrinth growing up. Um, And I remember watching it and like not liking the movie. And the reason I didn't like the movie, I think, was because I saw too much of myself in David Bowie's character. And I was like, "Uh, I can't confront this right now. Like, I can't think about this too deeply right now because I'm not in a space where I feel safe to think about it. You know, it's like it's like it felt kind of like if you are on a. It would be like watching the Food Network on a desert island, you know, like when you don't have any hope of figuring out, of realizing this, why think about the fact that other people feel this way yeah. or whatever. But I think, you know, as as I got older, I'm trying to think of like who, you know, I, I think partially the burgeoning trans movement really pushed me to kind of claim more quickly and in a more politicized way, how I understand myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the first time I heard of anybody who was like gender nonconforming, I was probably 25. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's very late to, like, I guess my next question should be like, when did you realize that gender was not binary mm-hmm. and was not immutable and that mm-hmm. you had a choice? Well, it's not like I didn't have gender nonconforming people around me. Oh, really? And that's, well, it's, it, I think that that's sort of the myth, right? Is that, is that, uh, non-binary or genderqueer as terms are kind of a new are they're like a repackaging of a principle that's fundamental to humanity right okay like gender non-conforming people have been around literally forever like yeah as long as there have been people and as long as there have been genders there have been people who have lied outside of whatever the gendered norm was at the time um and and i say i say that specifically not termed in, or not framed in terms of masculinity or femininity because historically our ideas of masculinity and femininity aren't even useful right right because gender varies so widely throughout global cultures and varies like what feels like masculinity here feels totally different if you look you know 3000 years ago and halfway around the world right so i i think that you know we have th- there's this huge legacy of gender nonconforming people throughout history it's just that i was never taught about them Right. I was never like we're not in the history books because the history books were written by people who had an interest in us not being visible or yeah. being seen. But we've always been here. Uh, I mean, in the history books, it's like Stonewall happened, period. But did anything happen before or since? But yeah. um, I mean, you saying that makes me realize like, oh, like my entire like circle of queer friends, like nobody is gender non non-con- is, you know, conforming. Yeah, There's exactly. My like my my women friends who have short hair and like dress like yeah. stereotypically masculine and mm. um I mean I I I've been like pushing, let's say, like my yeah. gender expression yeah. lately and wearing like a like a really long t-shirt. Yeah. And like it's a start. It's like a push, you yeah, know. Yeah, and that's and that's part of it is like I don't I'm not interested in gender nonconforming or gender queer or non-binary being this like very exclusive um you know, well-defined label. I'm not interested in that at all. Like, that's not the world that I want to live in. I want to live in a world, like, I use the term genderqueer and politicize my gender in a certain way in order to create a world where my gender doesn't have to be as political. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm really, I would love a world in which gender expression doesn't come with so much power, right? Where, in a world where patriarchy is not not sort of a thing anymore, so we are able to express our genders without them being so politicized and without them holding such weight. And I think we can create that world, but it's kind of like we have to kind of, there, there are, I feel like the, the idea of gender queerness, the idea of gender nonconformity is important in getting there. It's a tool towards getting to a world where gender labels don't have to function in the same ways. Right. And not to sound like grandiose, but I think it's such an exciting time. Oh, let's sound grandiose. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. To sound um, grandiose. Okay, to sound grandiose, which we will continue to do. Yeah. I think that it's such an exciting time that we are literally creating language and like inventing mm. definitions for like mm. how to describe ourselves and like other people. Mm. I think that is so cool like at this point in history. Yeah. But I think it's important that we don't see that work as like original, 
Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like or it, fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I think that's you know, there's a there's an interesting disconnect between you know older queer folks and sort of younger like non-binary gender queer activists because a lot of older queer folks are like, we just used to call that gay. Right. You know, or like we used to just call that like, you know, it wasn't the like gender queers. It was just like fairies. Right. Like people, the, the language was different, but we still had the idea. You're not doing anything new, you know. And I'm like, yeah, duh. But like, sometimes you need to rebrand it to like for larger acceptance. Yeah. You always need rebrands every now and then. <laughs> right. I mean. But I think of too, like the word like uh, like sexually fluid. Like, yeah. OK, that's that's called bisexual or pansexual. Yeah. But like sexually fluid is so I think. I think we're gravitating towards that word because it's so less pressure, mm. so much more welcoming. Mm. You know, like this boy's Diddy and girl, so you're not like bisexual. No, I'm still bisexual, but like fluid. Mm. There's just like no expectations. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the world that hopefully we're creating is one in which, you know, gender doesn't have to come with so many expectations yeah. and like having a penis or a vagina doesn't sort of like condemn you to living within one box. Right. You know, I'm just like, I'm kind of bored of that. I'm a little sleepy. It makes me a little <laughs> sleepy. But where we are, it's like today in America, do you think mm. a person can be openly gender queer and not be an activist? Mm. I ask because for so many people, you living openly and the fact of your existence is still mm. a radical act. Well, and it's, I, you know, I, I, I agree with that. I think that that sort of survival at this point for most of us is pretty radical and sort of thriving and continuing to display and, and share yourself openly with the world is a, a political choice. Yeah. Um, but in my own personal journey, I'm actually trying to think of myself as less of an activist because I realized that sort of thinking of myself as an activist was in some way, it was, it was like, it's sort of like redundant, right? Like, it's kind of like, I don't need to say that I'm an activist. I just need to show up as I am and say, but lead with the other things that I want to do, right? And focus on the other things that I want to accomplish. And then I don't have to do the activist. I don't have to say like, hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a gender queer activist. I need to say like, hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a writer and producer, yeah. you know, like, because that that's like what I actually do. The activism is heavily implied, you know, and I'm not worried about like my, my political perspective will always be in the, in the work that I create. You know, but it's sort of like it's it's I don't know. I feel like it's like this is wet water. You know, it's like, duh, it's of course it's wet. It's water. Right. Like it's like, yeah, I mean, a, a, a gender like a gender nonconforming producer and writer who's like making strides in the industry. Like, of course, you're an activist. Duh. Right. Like. And then it'll be in your work. Yeah. 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 You know, and 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 also it feels like I'm I'm trying to think about myself as less other. I think I, for a while I really got off on feeling like I'm unique and I'm different than everyone. And I'm this like courageous lone person on this journey. And then that's kind of, I mean, for a while that felt kind of glamorous. And then I realized like, actually, I just want to feel supported and in community with people. And I'm really, I want to find ways to not make it feel like I'm doing something alone here, right? Like we're invested in this journey together, right? Like cis men and I are invested in a journey together. We have mutual work to do. Yeah. And that's why you're here right now. Yeah. 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 And like, and I want to talk about that and I want to, and I want to share that with folks and thinking of myself as like, oh, you know, thinking of myself as like, as only an activist sort of takes the emphasis off of the tools that I'm going to use in order to do that, right? Because I think that that's, that's more, maybe more of it is activist is like such a general term. And I want to be like, no, let's be specific about the things I'm really good at and the tools that I'm using to get there, right? I'm either like, like, oh, I'm the executive director of this organization or, oh, I'm the founder and, you know, and head of this campaign or, oh, like I'm the producer and director of this show or, oh, I'm the star of this thing, right? Like, yeah. let's focus on those aspects because the rest of it will line up. Yeah. I don't know. And no, uh, that makes total sense. And it's very well said. Um, let's start here now yeah. then. Like, what else are you doing? <laughs> Obviously, like I called you a leading voice. Um, and we, I think you my don't... bio says that too, <laughs> because, you know. Well, um, I didn't want to label you as an activist too, yeah. just because like, like you said, there's more to mm. you. Mm. I mean, so you host this web series at NBC. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy it. The, the, I love the content and that joy is overshadowed by reading the comments sections. Oh God, like, don't look at the comments on my, on my, I, I've looked at them like once and I was like, oh my God, I can't even start. Like <laughs> don't, it's not even worth, it's not even worth trying. 
And part- if you read it, though, the way you read comments, and this is something I think we need to practice better as, like, you know, little baby queers. We need to, like, be better about this, is comment sections are only an indication of just how effective you are. Yes. In reading the comments, I was like, these are the people that need to watch this twice. Yeah. You know, like, take notes, please. Well, and I think the quote that I always think about when navigating the internet is it's, it's that, I believe it's, it's a Gandhi quote, and it's like, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Right? And for most of these people, they are going from ignoring me to either laughing at me or fighting me. And I'm like, great, so we're closer to winning. Almost there. That's it, right? Yeah. Like and and I think that that was something when I when I agreed to do the web series with NBC News, I knew that part of the reason why it would be vital is because NBC News' audience is not there. They don't know this stuff. They don't take this stuff for granted. They don't understand what the gender binary is or what that language means. They understand it on a visceral level, but they haven't had it explained to them in a way that's accessible before. And so I knew that I'd be kind of committing to educating an audience that perhaps wasn't there yet. But that's why I knew it was vital and important. Mm -hmm. That's why I knew I needed to do it. Um, And that's why it feels gratifying to be involved in that project and to be curating that content. And I I 100% agree. And I think that like when these people go out and like meet gender queer people in their lives, it's not gonna be the first time. Yeah. And that's so, as you said, vital. Mm. I, yeah, mm. I love that. I think so. E- especially, um, you grew up in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I um, What if I only brought you here to discuss that? I feel like it comes up in every <laughs> in interview. It's so funny because it's like, <laughs> I feel like, I mean, you must feel this too, where it didn't, because I mean, you know, we're both from North Carolina yeah. and being from North Carolina used to be like, oh, cute. I've heard great things about like Raleigh or like, oh, like Asheville's so pretty, isn't it? Oh, the mountains, oh, the beach, right? And now it's like, Oh, you're from North Carolina. Yeah. I, well, and I mean, I'm sure like the audience is like tired of hearing about it. Yeah. But um, like like you said, it used to be like, oh, did you grow up on a farm? Mm-hmm. And it's like, no. And now it's like, oh, wow. So you you grew up in Raleigh. Yeah. Okay, that's the bigger, the bigger city. Raleigh's so cute. Oh, my God. I mean, like the North Carolina General Assembly is located there, but like there are a bunch of weirdos from out of town. You know, like people from Raleigh, for the most part, are pretty lovely and open minded. Oh, and that's how I describe the people from North Carolina. I just say that the executives in charge are like the crazies and they're the more conservative. People. It's just that like the people who vote in North Carolina are fucked up. Am I allowed to say fuck? Yeah, you can say it. OK, I just said it. It's the internet. It's fine. I just said it after asking. And I was like, I shouldn't. <laughs> Anyway, um, but the, like, do, did you? It's a. It's like I consider the Bible Belt. Did you grow up in a religious family? I did, but it wasn't like it wasn't like 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 Bible thumping per se, right? Like my dad grew up Catholic, uh, and still I think still identifies as Catholic, but like pretty, you know, like in a very pretty chill way. Um, my mom grew up in the Baptist church, but not, but then sort of started, you know, is, is now more a Methodist. And so I grew up in the Methodist church um, and, you know, went to, was like, I was like a power church kid, right? Like I was one of those, I was like who, on the leadership group of the youth group. I was like, you know, I, I was saying in the choir and played handbells and went to prayer meetings. I was at, youth, I was at church like two nights a week. Oh my God, North like, Carolina loves a handbell concert. Oh my God, handbell concerts are everything. You should handbells? have told me beforehand. Handbell? Did you play handbells? Yes, of course. Oh my God, yes. What? <laughs> Wait, what were you? Did you play like bass bells, trouble? Where were you? I was the highest one. Oh, it was the, the least amount of work though. Wow, because you like just like so. One, I played two, like three. the super big bass bells, like the giant silver ones. Like our church had those, like the big silver super bassy ones. Yeah. So I was like that butch dude down at the bottom, like playing the big bells. And also I was like the you know this fabulous little queen being like yeah with these giant bells that were like the size of my head. No, they were bigger than my head. They were like that my head could fit inside them comfortably with yeah. like lots of room you called yourself a fabulous get were you out at this time um yeah so i mean i came out like i can't the first the first label that i came out as was gay right um and i think that's also partially why i'm trying not to be super duper attached to the label of genderqueer specifically because i'm like well i used to think they were gay was super duper important to me and now i look back at like essays that i wrote back then about the word gay and i'm kind of like lol these like yeah. things change labels change meanings change like language evolves so maybe i shouldn't be as attached to a one specific label because i'm probably gonna like 15 years from now be like no I use a different word now um but you know it's like the artist formerly known as you know whatever right like <laughs> yeah the, as we are allowed to though. yeah the gender queer person formerly known as uh, as as gay right like right. um but uh yeah my my youth like my faith community was relatively supportive I think they were a little bit they were a little overwhelmed because I was so confident about it. I was just like, hi, I'm here. And like, obviously Jesus loves me. Like, duh. And obviously like the Bible totally supports the fact that like queer people are part of faith traditions always. And queer people are part, you know, have, you you know, a unique understanding of oppression that links us to the divine and like whatever. And they were just kind of like, whoa, like 
And I was like, yeah, Jesus hung out with like, you know, working class people and sex workers and, you know, like all kinds, like a, a total, like all the outcasts and weirdos. So clearly queer people are among that, duh. And everyone was like, whoa, you just like, you're like saying all these things and you're, and I don't know if I'm like allowed to just agree with them because you're saying them really confidently and enthusiastically, right. but they're like, oh, it's so rational. We can't argue. Yeah. But then, but then there was sort of this hesitancy too around like me sort of just like being as, as open and as, as transparent as I was. Um, it's interesting because it, it, I think that the real letdown, it was, it was not about it wasn't really like it wasn't like I had anyone telling me like we need to pray for you to get better right like that never happened but it was that I was ready to I I cannot and still cannot I can never understand any of my faith journey without without it being profoundly linked to my queerness and my and my and my gender because that is so much a part of my journey in life and you can't like separate you can't you can't compartmentalize those things right um and so I had no, I have no, I still have no way of talking about my faith journey without rooting it in my queerness. And that was, I think, what people weren't ready for. They could handle me being like low key gay, you know, but I wanted to talk about it. And they were like, oh, like that's, I don't know if all the youth group leader adults are ready to talk about it in the way that you're ready to talk about it because you're just like linking your queerness to the divine over here. And they are like not sure what the word lesbian means. You know, it was like that kind of thing. Okay, that's fascinating because most people, mm. uh, to stereotype, most people like just reject the religion outright. Mm. But you see it hand in, do you still see it hand in hand? I mean, yeah, like I, th I think that if you, I mean, I think anyone who who reads any sort of spiritual text, like I just see, I see queerness and I see the experiences of oppressed people and I see, um, justice and fairness and love like just sort of all over those right yeah like i don't have i don't have any way of understanding uh like any sort of faith text that doesn't incorporate like queerness and the and the divine and and god you know like i don't i don't know I, and it's funny too because i'm like that girl who shows back up at christmas service and i'll be like our mother who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy queendom come you know and i and everyone like looks like i'll just sort of say it like normal volume and everyone sometimes people will catch it and sometimes people won't but i'm just like yeah god's a woman get over it or god's like probably a trans woman of color right like that's probably who god is um yeah. if anything like if anthropomorphize that's probably who god is right now i mean they can't prove you one way or another no i've always said that um that like you know like it's very clear to me that like Jesus was trans right because let's and let's let me break it down so if you believe that God is too big for and it's it's funny because like I'm not super practicing in my spirituality but like but but intellectually I just know these things to be true um, so if you, if God is too big for any gendered label which obviously God must be right like I like God can't be just like no I'm a man like what the hell that's ridiculous so God is obviously too big for any gendered label because God created all genders so must understand all of them right so then Jesus is a male bodied person historically I guess uh, who has a genderless divine soul inside of a male body so like duh that's trans like people were like, "Oh, you're a man," and, and Jesus was like, "No, no, no, no. Like, I, I'm like actually divine, so I'm actually all of the genders in a male body. So like, my gender identity does not correspond with my like as perceived sex assigned to birth. So I'm trans. I am fairly religiously ignorant. Yes, it was gender a genderless divine body? Is that like from the text? I mean, I don't know, but it's <laughs> it's obvious to me, right? It's and that's okay. one of the things he had long hair. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying that it's. I'm just saying that like like I can't I can't like the idea that God has a specific gender. I'm just like that's ridiculous. Like people use pronouns for God in the Bible, like because they were lazy at editing. I love that. You know. Yeah. It's just very clear to me. I, uh, and part of faith journeys is that you don't have to necessarily cite everything that you believe. You're allowed to believe it and be like, why? Because God tells me these things. I know them. And like one's gender and sexual identity, it's allowed to be fluid and to change yeah. that one's life. Yes. And faith is a personal journey. And so you're allowed to claim what you know and feel to be true in your little heart. And here you are. Here I am. <laughs> Which, you know, I'm like that, I'm like that awkward, I'm like that awkward ki kid who has like super lots of thoughts about faith and religion and like not that much commitment to it. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I think it's a modern millennial crisis. It's great. <laughs> it's a very modern way of thinking about it. You're know. very trendy. Uh, oh, Lord. Ha, ha, I'm going to get myself in trouble for this interview. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> um, has being genderqueer uh, affected who you're attracted to? 
attraction is so complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard because it's like, I feel like in certain ways, um, understand learning to understand my own gender identity and then learning to sort of analyze and think about who I'm attracted to and why I'm attracted to them, right? Like I grew up with, I think as much, um, I think the gender binary really impacts the way that our sexuality is constructed, right? Yeah. Like we grew up with this, you know, in the same way that, that, that the gender binary and the way that it's propagated through, you know, media and, and film and whatever impacts our personal identity development. It also impacts like how we understand what can be and cannot be perceived as attractive. Right. And so I think I'm still doing a lot of internal work, you know, to figure out like, how do I, how do I get over the gender binary in my own attractions? Like, how do I, is that something I can do? Cause it's complicated. I'm not sure if I can. Yeah. Right. Cause if you, th if I think about sort of like my base, like who I had crushes on when I was a kid, it was like, you know, like all the typical, like dumb ones, like Prince Charming. I was like, oh my God, you know, like, and like all the like, you know, gentle masculinity, Disney princes types. Right. And, and there's something to me about sort of just going with that, that feels, that feels like this isn't rigorous enough. Like we gotta, we gotta get beyond that. Yeah, and in gen or uh, beauty, like yeah. beauty standards, are just, uh, standards are just so engendered yeah. too. It's wild, and it's hard too. I mean, you know, I think one thing, one place where I'm still very active in my in my journey of like self acceptance is love is trying to sort of understand, like understand myself and understand people like me as like that there is like hope for us being dateable or able to sort of be part of just like normal, stable, happy, healthy relationships, right? Like I know so many trans people, um, particularly trans feminine people who are just like, who just haven't dated in years, right? Like even really successful, like trans celebs, some of the people I know, like their their personal dating lives have just been abysmal for a really long time. And visibility doesn't really help with that, right? Yeah. Because visibility has to transform the whole culture. So if it means if you're visible as sort of like a first of your you know, for like a first among your group, odds are culture is going to get going to take like 10 or 15 years to really catch up to where you are. Right. And understanding myself as like beautiful and dateable, wearing a dress and lipstick and a beard and whatever, like it takes a lot of internal work to to not only believe that I feel that way myself, because I do now. Right. Like I'm in a place where like, I look in the mirror and I'm like, damn, you're cute. Right. But then believing that someone else will also do that level of internal work and learn to be okay with me like that's something where i'm kind of like can i can i expect that from the world is that asking too much and it's like no it's not asking too much is it a lot is is it is it is it hard to find in the world that we're in yes but am i working pretty actively and are other advocates i know working pretty actively to redefine those things and challenge our erotic marginalization and our desexualization as trans people yes and are we going to sort of get to a place where that's a lot better yeah and probably that just means that my sex life is going to be a lot better when I, you know when i'm a little bit older yeah absolutely because the world will catch up with me you know <laughs> It's like I'm on that. You'll like, build your career till then. It's yeah, fine. like I, there are so three. Like what is what is the will I am line? It's like I'm so three thousand and eight. There are so two thousand and late. You know, and I'm like you got to get on that three thousand and eight level with me. Yeah, it, it, if you that song came out in two thousand eight. That's eight years ago. Doesn't that blow your mind? It, it like it like came out was like outdated within like three months. I know, but it was so good for the period of time. I'm just saying, like, why, like, cite, like, a date? And, yeah, that's a different conversation. It's true. Yeah, you should never put reference specific dates in your songs if you want I, them to be evergreen. I'll critique songs later. Okay. <laughs> um, last thing about dating. Yes. How do you solve the issue of, like, people get together, they date, and then become boyfriend or girlfriend? Yeah. Two gendered words. Like, jumping right to partner, it, like, creates so much pressure. I think partner is fine. I like boo. Okay. I just want to be everybody's boo. Be like, hey, boo. Hey, boo, what's up? <laughs> oh, this is Jacob. They're my boo. <laughs> okay. We're I just boos. have, like, trans friends who, like, they are dating. And um, and they're like, oh, my God, like, partner's so serious. We don't want to do that. Mm. And I haven't found yet for us a, like, a better word. Maybe pal. Pal, that's Maybe horrible. Chum. Pal is never pal. <laughs> I'll suggest boo. Boo. Yeah. Boo. I like that a lot. <laughs> my squeeze. I love squeeze. I feel like it's squeeze, then boo, then partner. Squeeze. Squeeze is like. Is that a New York thing? I don't know. Like my squeeze, right? Like it's like I don't. Is that a is that a New York thing? Maybe it is. Maybe it's East Coast. I don't know. 
I don't live on the West Coast. I don't know all this. I don't know the cool slang out in Los Angeles. I'm here to t- I'll, I'll tell you all the slang. I'll after. figure it out. Okay, yeah. great. We'll do um, a lesson. Yeah, we're almost out of time, but I, I one more question. Um, hmm. Do you think about raising children and whether or not you will like gender them, mm. like raising like a small like child and client like them, they and them. I think, I mean, my, my commitment to whatever little babies I end up raising is that they get to determine their gender for themselves. Yeah. And I think, I think that if the universe has a sense of humor, I'm going to end up having a jock and a cheerleader and the jock's going to be a boy and the cheerleader is going to be a girl. And I'm going to just like have all my life just been like, are you sure that's what you feel good about? Are you are you happy? And they'll be like, yeah, like I'm just queen. a jock dad. Like, Wait, but, but, but like pre-language though, or like pre like figuring out gender identity, even yeah. like a three and four. Oh yeah, but the thing is like, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like hyper gender my children. Of okay. course not. I don't yeah. think anyone should, but the reality is that like the world around them will hyper gender them for me. Yeah. I mean, I like, and right, like, even parents who try and gender their children in a healthy way, right? Like one of my friends, um, one of my mentors, like she has two children now. Uh, she just had her second child, so cute. Um, but her youngest daughter, like, you know, she tries to always sort of instill a really healthy understanding of like femininity and a healthy understanding of womanhood that's not so limited, that's not so just princesses in pink or whatever. Yeah. But the problem is that her, you know, her daughter's friends are all like princess pink girls, you know, and they and they're all all their parents are saturating them with that culture. And so they can't like so she started buying into that because that's what the cool girls are doing, yeah. even though her home life is different. And so I think part of what I realize is that I'm not going to be able to control everything about the gendered environment in which my children grow up and what their peers think who are instructed by their shitty parents is probably going to weigh more than what I think about them. That's a wild, that story that it's, that's a New York, right? Yeah. Wow. But like, think about how many like bougie parents are just like, this is my little princess. People do that all the time. Yeah. You know? And so I think I have a pretty, I don't know. I feel like I have a pretty like nihilist opinion of like what my kids are going to end up doing. I feel like they're going to end up being like, oh, you're such a freak mappa. And I'm just going to be like, oh my God, like your teenage rebellion is so uncute right now. And then you're going to like, let's say you like marry somebody that's also gender yeah. queer. You're like, oh, we can't have two mappas. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll just, I don't know. I feel like I could be pop. Pop is cute. I could be ma. The, my could high be, femme mom called pop. I don't know. I could be a lot of things. I'm kind of like language is playful and familial language. You can do a million things. You can. It. And you have so much time to figure it out. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming. Hopefully. <laughs> I think um, this was so much fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, if anybody wants, like, read your work, like, check out more about you, like, where can they find you? Well, um, so I think you can go to jacobtobio.com, um, and then also like follow me on Insta and Facebook and Twitter and stuff. I post, you know, Great. all my all my things there. If you want to see Jacob's outfit? Go to Instagram. Yeah, and also you can check out Queer 2.0 on NBC News. Oh, that's great. Thank yeah, you. Just Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then all of our stuff is on iTunes. You can watch us on YouTube if you want to see our faces. And of course, guys, please on iTunes. You know what? I just said, just dawn on me. I was going to say give us five stars, but I said, guys. Oh, yeah. Well, so let me rephrase that. I I don't know. I don't. I I like folks. I like to. I like folks. Be inclusive. Um, So, all right, guys, girls, and gender nonconformers, folks, rate us five stars on iTunes. Yeah. I'll be more mindful of that. Um, Thank you so much. Goodbye. Of course. (laughs) Bye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.